Hello, LA. <laughs> Hello, LA, and welcome to another episode of To Live and Buy in Los Angeles. I am your co host, Zach Goldsmith, alongside my co pilot, Philly native, and self proclaimed king of the chili cheesesteak, Ben Belak. Today, we have a very special guest with us. He comes to us by way of Chicago, Illinois, weighing in at 100 and what, 66 pounds? 85. <laughs> 85. Jay is an actor, writer, director, author, comedian, app creator, father, husband, and sometimes friend. <laughs> <laughs> Though I'm sure over all of those, he would most appreciate being referred to as golfer. <laughs> That's true. Best known for starting the Broken Lizard comedy troupe and creating such hit films as Super Troopers, Beer Fest, and Club Dread. He has directed multiple TV shows, including The Goldbergs, Community, Arrested Development. He directed Burt Reynolds and Jessica Simpson in the hit film The Dukes of Hazard. And his latest film, Quasi, is out now. I believe you can watch it on one of those streaming networks. Hulu. Don't jump in yet. He is a great <laughs> stand-up comic, one of the funny people in the world. You can see him performing all over the country. This legend does not particularly want to be here today, but that is what you get when you miss an uphill three-footer on 18 <laughs> for par. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jay Chandrasekhar. Hello. You know, the reason I came this time as opposed to last time was because, I mean, you, you just you heard my resume, right? It's like it's impressive. Right. <laughs> so when you last time you're like, can you come in and do the podcast in the afternoon? Because that's when all the engineers and the recording people are available. Yeah. And I'm like, I play golf in the afternoon and and you, Ben, refused to bend and said, well, that's when we record. And I said, well, then you don't have me. And so when you tried again this time, I said, I can only do it in the morning. And you said, OK, uh -huh. in response to my resume, I'm guessing you took a look at it. So here I am. <laughs> oh, I thought because the time doesn't doesn't mess with my golf game. It's true. I, I did not look at your resume previously. I just right. thought that you were a degenerate gambling like <laughs> golf dude that was independently wealthy at Mountain Gate. And once I looked at your resume, I said, you know what? Maybe in a few weeks we'll bend. But let me see if we wait him out. Maybe he'll need the publicity and the strength of the show. Behind I, I figured you turned us down last time because you wanted time to grow your resume. Is that <laughs> not the case? You added no. a couple things? No. And even this time he snuck attack me. Um, <laughs> I did. <laughs> tell him what I did. Tell, tell me again what you did. <laughs> I said, hey, um, our, oh, yes, yeah, I right. was like, what are you doing Thursday? And he was, I was Love like, it. are you in town? And he was like, yeah. I'm like, great. Can you do the podcast? Because <laughs> he thought I was going to say, can you play? He said, yeah, what are you doing Thursday? I thought we were going to go play golf. And he, and I already expressed my availability. He's a salesman. It's a smart move. I'm and a closer. It's, but it's the like truth in your it, 20s. You're in your 20s and someone's like, hey, were you busy next week? No, man. What's going on? I need you to help me move right so my thing my question is before we get started you really don't want to be here we know that why did you decide ultimately to do this show today I told you it was a sneak attack. Oh, once you said once I said I was available, <laughs> oh, there was it was impossible even. for me to then go. And you would do it in the morning. And I, now I had run out of reasons to say no. <laughs> yeah, by the way, rarely go. It was a morning. He falls out of town. It was a long Everything pause. Everything lined up perfectly. It was a long pause for him to <laughs> respond. Was. I made you wait. It's Let's true. get into it. So your start, you grew up in Chicago, started acting in high school and college and thought <laughs> I'm self-centered and fearless enough to try my hand at making people laugh on stage. That how is that a question? It is. It didn't sound like one. <laughs> well, I guess you got to, you know, you forgot to put a little like I'm going to go up in your in your tone at the end of self-centered, I suppose. Sure. Yeah. Uh, That's but, why his auto text never works for it. <laughs> <laughs> it never does. That's all right. So, yes, I um, I was, you know, what would I say? I, I got laughs from my friends. Uh, and so um, when I was in high school, uh, I was like a freshman in high school at this new school. And I went from being, you know, popular eighth grader to like, you know, freshman, whatever. And so my sister was, who was a year older, she goes, why don't you 
try out for the play and you meet a bunch of people and you can be in the chorus or whatever, you know, you sing in the background. And I'm like, play? All right, I'll do that. So I go and audition for the play and there's a big chorus, like 40 people, and they don't put me in. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? Can I swear on this thing? Yeah. Uh, I'm like, and then I, then it became a matter of like rageful pride that they were uh, the next play. I was getting in this goddamn chorus. Mm. And so the next time they had an audition, I, I went again. It was for a, a Scottish musical called Brigadoon. <laughs> and I played a Scottish. That, that role you got? Uh, well, I, I not only was in the chorus, I had about I had a couple singing lines in it. Uh, and I played a Scottish Klansman and we're chasing a guy and I got a kilt on. I got it. You were typecast. Nothing thing on under the kilt uh, and my line was I'm chasing a guy right I'm like I'll go down to the creek and by God if I see him I'll throw him in it <laughs> and that's it that was it's the beginning races. Well, that was like the beginning and then from there I started really auditioning and I started being the lead in plays I was Tony in West Side Story I, you know I had quite a quite a singing voice back then really? and then I went to college and you know continued to sort of be the lead in plays and then I eventually uh, went to Chicago for a semester to try to my hand at sort of the improv kind of game uh, and I was such uh, a, like a low level improviser but well Chris Farley was in the, it was in the highest level I was in the lowest level Ooh, cool. but we we're in the same class together. And so we got to know each other and we, we kind of we partied a little hard. Um, but, but, um, uh, my improv group was all beginners. It was all like moms and accountants and like dudes at real estate agents. Uh, and it, it, we would go through these shows and it was just a grinding silence. <laughs> and I was like, if I don't make strangers laugh, I'm not going to attempt show business. And so I wrote 10 minutes of material, signed up for an open mic, went across town, did the 10 minutes. I raced through in about five, but I got laughs. And ultimately I'm like, okay, I, I can make strangers laugh as opposed to just my friends. So I decided I was going to try show business. There's a huge difference in being funny with your friends and funny to strangers. That's on right. Stage. With strangers, for strangers. So, so that crossover came by you actually writing material that related to the outside world. Well, yeah, I just wrote 10 minutes of stand up. Yeah. And and did it. And, you know, it, it's hard to do that. Do you just, remember any bits from? the? Uh, I did something about how people who drive cars you can tell their ethnicity based on the car they do <laughs> some sure. part of nonsense sure, sure. um and but you know I, I was so like bound up inside from the stress of walking on the stage that i had diarrhea in that first club and then continued to have it every time I went up for about 10 years. So I, what? I've, I've shit in all the major uh, comedy clubs in the country. Oh, no. And, yeah, and was eventually it stopped. And it stopped around the time where I was like 10,000 hours. Well, yeah, they were like, oh, you're up. I'm like, OK, let's go. And I was suddenly like, I'm not really I'm not worried about the outcome up here anymore. It's going to go well. And the and my and I solidified. You, you did solidify. And it. I stopped having to even shit. <laughs> You've been shit since the now 80s. You're constipated. <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's an incredible feeling to get to a place where you're comfortable in silence. Yes. Well, right. Like you were telling me about your recent stand up. Recent there. Bombing, yeah. Where I actually felt empowered <laughs> by not getting last for the first time in my life the last year I felt like if whatever I've done on stage the bits that haven't worked have empowered me I've never felt so few right That's because you've embraced this pariah role <laughs> well <laughs> yeah, you like being a shit so now you're like oh this isn't funny you guys don't like it great take it you know like this gets you oh, aroused my guy my oh. my mom says um because she she uh outlawed we, we don't have any umbrellas in our house we never did and she goes and she says because your hair because the wet. rain <laughs> the, because the rain wet. is as good as the sun that's what she says how did she say it though like Dude, that because the rain is as good as the sun <laughs> right and so we didn't have umbrellas and i was telling her that i bombed up on stage and she said you know em embrace it she goes embrace she goes because isn't this an incredible moment you're up on stage the lights are on you there's a whole audience of people not laughing at you try to have fun during that mm. 
and talk to them about that and then see what happens. Your mom said this? Yeah. And so I did. I, I was stood up there and I'm like, you didn't like that joke, did you? And I would start talking to them about my failure up on there and they would start laughing at that because I think they saw humanity. Sure. And then suddenly I was able to sort of wind my way out of these failures. Yeah, I found that like the more honest and genuine, authentic you can be on stage, the more open and vulnerable. That's yeah. when things start changing. Yeah, but that's it a hard place to get to. <clears throat> Very Andy Kaufman or early Jim Carrey used to do that. I mean, you still got to write good material. So wait, so you're you're writing stand up. Well, first you're doing plays, <laughs> then you you're doing improv. It's not the right. Um, it's not the right format or the ideal format. Then you go to stand up. What? What prompts you to start writing a screenplay? Well, what happened was then I went back to Colgate for my senior year. Um, and this guy, John Glatzer, who was a writer on Succession recently, he had started a theater group junior year, which I, I, I started in a couple of plays for him. So when he, he was going away to London for a semester and he wanted to keep his theater group going. So he, he, he said, I'm going to have four one acts. And he called me, he said, why don't you do that improv group that you were talking about in Chicago? You came back and you told us how great you were. And I, I did. I had gone back to Chicago. I'm like, yeah, I worked with Chris Farley. I'm an improviser. I worked with Del Clo Like I was like really talking a big game, even though I was the worst improviser in Chicago. And he's like, why don't you start a group at Colgate? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, maybe I will. Maybe Maybe I will. Uh -huh. And so I went to my friend Kevin Heffernan, who now plays Farva in the movies, and I'm like, let's uh, let's start an improv group. And he goes, what do you mean? I'm like, you know, like like I did in Chicago, like Chris Farley. And Farley was already on his way to Saturday Night Live at this time. So what we would, t I had touched greatness, I thought. Uh, and did you know it at the time with him? Was he that? He was always good? the funniest guy in the room, in a room full of very funny guys. And humble, and right? He felt uh, like he seemed to do Yes, he... he he projected humbleness, it's you know, humility as a writer, just FYI. He projected humility. There you go, pal. Yeah, so. there's that. It reminds me of that great Andy Samberg joke from Popstar. He has a, a lyric is, uh, <laughs> I am the humblest. <laughs> My apple crumble is the crumblest. <laughs> That's good. It works. Um, <laughs> but I went back to Colgate and I said, let's start a comedy group. And he's like, are you out of your mind? He goes, our friends are so cynical. They're going to laugh at us. And I said, yeah, you're right. So I called the guy and I'm like, I'm not doing the comedy group. And he goes, what do you mean? I, I, I need a fourth play. I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing it. So then I, over the summer, uh, I messed up the timing a little, but I, I go to, uh, I go to the Grateful Dead. I just go four nights at Alpine Valley. I camp. I do Jerry. Yeah. Four hits acid. I saw Jerry uh, too. That was the first time I did acid too. Uh, and then I come back to Chicago to my house and I get a call from Jonathan Glasser. He goes, I really need you to do this, this improv thing because I got three one acts already going. You're the, you're the fourth. And I'm like, all right, fine. So I call my friend Kevin Heffern. He's a dishwasher in Nantucket, a job he held for a week. He got fired. He thinks cause he's fat. So, uh, 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 and so I'm like, hey, man, you want to do that comedy group? Remember I was talking about Chris Farley, the whole thing? He goes, I already told you we're not doing it. I'm like, yeah, you're right. We're not doing it. Okay. So I called <laughs> Glatzer. I'm like, you out of it. I'm like, we're not doing it, dude. So now I'm back senior year. I'm at school. And I'm like drinking on a Tuesday night. Phone, the pay phone rings. We didn't have cell phones then. And uh, this pledge comes and goes, hey, you got a phone call from London. And I'm like, oh, God. So I'm like, what's up? And he goes, uh, you're doing the comedy group. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. And I'm like, all right, fine. Fuck it. So I hang up and I go up to Kevin's room and I'm like, we're doing the comedy group. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. <laughs> and he goes, all right, fine. Fuck it. And so we start this improv group and I'm, I call all the funniest people I know. And half of them say no, uh, but half of them are not even actors. And I'm like, we're doing a comedy group. They're like, all right, if you say so. And so we do all these, I'm doing all these improv games. Now I'm the worst improv in Chicago leading a group of people who've never done improv in their life. And we're doing these things in rehearsal and there's no laughter because there's no audience, right? And we're like, is this funny? I don't know if this is funny. And after about two weeks of this, I'm like, we're not doing an improv group anymore. What we're doing is a sketch group. We're going to imitate Saturday Night Live show. We're going to write sketches and we're going to do short films in between so that we have time to change from a mermaid costume to a gorilla costume, whatever. And because we had a guy who was from L.A. who kind of was like, we could do short films, too. And so that's how it started. 
that's how the writing started. That's how the writing started. Well, that's how Broken Lizard uh, yeah, was created. Yeah, that's right. It was called Charred Goosebeak at Colgate. Right. It, now, that that group is still going 25 years later. Is that right? Yeah. Um, getting residuals? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but there, you know, like, uh, it's, it's uh, and we did a show. And the first night, 30 people showed up with 270 empty seats. And the next night, 330 people showed up. And the next night, 400 people showed up. The next night. It was just thirty. We turning people away. That's incredible. It was a. It was in like a comedy explosion went off. It was incredible. How, how uh, come every play in Los Angeles is in a ninety nine seat theater, and how come you're in a three hundred seat theater on the first night? Well, we were at school, right? Oh. I mean, we were at school. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's why. So that so that broken lizard group, charred goose beak. Yeah. Is that it? That's right. Okay. That turns into... You don't have that in your little research? I do. It's up here somewhere. I just want to refer to it. Okay, got it. Charred Beat Group. Uh Uh-huh. So that turns into Broken Lizard, which at some point you decide we're going to write a movie. Well, I was, it was the, I graduated in 90. So I'm, um, we're in New, in New York city and what's happening in New York is the very, it's the red hot center of the independent film scene. And I end up going to work for this guy, John Sloss, who's the lawyer for Kevin Smith, Ed Burns, Whit still like Ed, Richard Linklater, every single independent film went through that office. Mm. And so I was like, look, if Kevin Smith can make a movie for 40 grand and if Eddie Burns can make a movie for 60 grand and if Richard Linklater can make a movie for 100 grand, like I can make a movie, too. So I like, let's do what Python did and let's write a movie for ourselves Mm -hmm. and then we'll fund it and make it. And the movie we wrote uh, was uh, we had to write a film that we could afford. So we wrote a film that's set at Colgate Puddle Cruiser and uh, we shot it like a college comedy. Oh, my God. Well, you say like we're going to fund it as if that was like so easy. Well, the the way people were funding it was they were asking, you know, rich relatives or they were, you know, like uh, Robert Rodriguez. The famous story was he gave a whole, like kept on giving blood and taking the money to buy film. I mean, is it true? I don't know. The stories were, were who knows what. But he was like donating blood for to try to get money for film. In our case, you know, I I I got money from my parents. I have just endless uncles who are and aunts who are doctors. And I got five grand, five grand, five grand. And we just pooled it together. And then at the end, we were about 60 grand short. And the credit card companies, by just a miracle, sent me a credit card that said Dr. Chandrasekhar. Uh And it was for 10 grand. And I'm like... Fuck yeah. So I, I said, yeah, yeah, took it. And then they sent me another one, another one. And I went up 60 grand in debt and they called me eventually. They're like, you're not a doctor, are you? And I'm like, I am not. <laughs> Your mistake. The film's done though. Uh, and we finished film, got into Sundance and sold it. And Oh, wow. That was a success. Here I am. Dude. Well, you're so, so they thought you were a doctor. Now, you come from a line of doctors. Obviously, you're, you're yes. a doctor. Yeah, a little bit of reverse racism, but, you know, that's a good kind of racism. And, and your sisters are lawyers. <laughs> Was that a point of contention in your house for you to be a stand-up comic? Well, they thought, you know... Like my dad said to me when I was applying to college, uh, you, you were saying that I was self-centered and um, I, I had big ego and that, that, that's probably true. Um, and so um, I thought I was so great that, and I had B pluses in, in, in high school. I'm like, Harvard's going to want me and Yale and Stanford, they're all going to want me. And so I'm applying to all these Ivy League schools with my B plus average. I mean, and, you know, okay. And my dad is like, he goes, why would they want a junky B plus Indian when there are all these good A plus Indians to choose from? <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, you watch, pal. <laughs> Shut out. Uh, oh, I get into, you repeat that story for I, years to come. Get into Colgate and Boston College and BU. And, um, but, you know, like expensive uh, schools, by the way, um, as a non-resident uh, BU, it's like for a non-resident in those days. Yeah. We're about the same age. It was like yeah. 30 grand a year. Sure. It was a lot. Sure. Whereas you could go to school in California as a resident, a state school for right. two grand. I lived semester. in Illinois, though. 
Mm-hmm. I'd have to go to your, I mean, I can't yeah, go to I mean. Universal. Yeah, that's what I mean. Sure. Yeah, so, sorry. My kid's school is like college, to, <laughs> full college tuition now. It is. It was yours. So it both is. Of our, all of our kids go to these awful private schools that just charge way too much. Right, but they teach them Great how to schools. write Expect- and read, and they teach them how to publicly speak. Uh, and I think that's valuable. You don't think public schools do that? I'm not saying they don't. I'm just saying what, what I paid for, the kids are coming out and they're the things that I think are important or they're doing. If they go to public school, will they do it? Sure. Maybe. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, maybe. Why not? I mean, who knows? Of course there are good public schools. So you made one of the great comedy classics of all time in Super Troopers. I feel like a line that you said in that movie will probably end up on your gravestone as well as said long after we're gone it stinks like sex in here uh no that's not it uh if if you would actually before i get to the question if you would grace us with that line um i'd be forever grateful who wants a mustache right that's fucking it (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah what is that can you well and describe for our viewers (laughs) what is a mustache (laughs) right I mean, it's don't it's, understand. it's said in a scene where my wife and I um, are talking seriously about the situation that we might have to move. And then the end of that scene, we walk into uh, our spare bedroom where there's a German couple uh, and they're swingers and we're going to swing. And I say, who wants a mustache ride? And the, the woman goes, I do, I do. And then the man says, I do, I do too. And it's <laughs> like, I'm like, let's go. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you're all in, huh? yeah. I mean, you know, swingers got to swing, as they always <laughs> say. Uh, so this it came, it came out now what over twenty years ago. And did you know, or at some point was there like this moment where you were like, "Shit, this is a classic." Well, let me just go back to this mustache right thing. So the, the, that came from. A combi- the mustache was an uh, was an homage to Burt Reynolds' mustache mm-hmm. because I was a big Burt Reynolds fan as a, as a, ch- as a child. The whole, the whole country was. And he hated you at one point. Uh, story, we, right? we, we had some issues, but then uh, <laughs> then uh, uh, and then Sam uh, Elliott, uh, great better mustache, incredible mustache, yeah. the top yeah. mustache in the in the in the business. Uh, he wore a shirt that said "Mustache rides." five cents in the movie the mask and we were the you know mask with the rocky was his name rocky right uh Shit, eric stoltz it? sure yeah and so we were you know because we watched every movie we saw the mask and we were like oh that's funny mustache rides five cents and we took it from there oh, wow. mm. um uh just to give you an origin of it it's such a disgust <laughs> are you fucking kidding me right Did now I drip? Are you going to leave a fucking green ring on my desk? <laughs> you you know fucking you're, you're, disgusting. You're you are vile. Miami nightclub cocktail. You are vile. The table could use some dressing. It's okay. dis- you're disgusting. <laughs> what even what is that? Okay, wait. So anyway, Jay, uh, I do want to know. Did you know? You yeah. Were you like, shit, this, this was- is a classic. <laughs> well, OK, so we cut the movie and the first film, Puddle Cruiser, in my opinion, had had a soft um, opening scene. Like it didn't generate the laughs that I thought were important. Um, I love the opening scene of Super Troopers. Right. So, so what we would do at Sundance is I should have watched it. It's so we would, you still haven't seen it, right? It's so so funny. The beginning is so funny. We would. So when we took the film Puddle Cruiser to Sundance, knowing we had a soft opening scene, we would do a whole sketch in front of the audience with like, like a ventrilo, like we'd pretend that the film print didn't show up and that we were like, but don't worry, it, it got eaten by the projector, but don't worry, there's a new one coming up from Salt Lake City. And the whole audience would go, oh, jeez. And they were like, it's really close. <laughs> and then somebody would start yelling from one of us, would be like, this is unprofessional that you didn't bring two prints to the Sundance Film Festival. And people would be like, hey, come on, give the guys a break. Like the audience would start kind of supporting. And then somebody else would attack that guy and it would be a guy with a ventriloquist dummy. He'd be like, oh, I think they're cool yeah. and you have this dummy and it was like what the hell is going on and then they start to realize there's a sketch going on and then a ups guy comes running in with the film he goes the film's here and he'd run down the aisle and then he would trip and the whole thing would unspool <laughs> right? and then we would do the that was we get him laughing and yes. then we start the movie so 
with Super Troopers, I'm like, we have to write a funny opening scene. We're not bringing that goddamn dummy to Sundance again. We're not mm-hmm. doing it. We're writing a funny scene. His name is Billy the Dummy. And I'm like, we're not doing it. And so we just concentrate and write what we think is a really funny opening scene. And we shoot it. And I'm, you know, we've never seen it in front of a crowd. So me, Kevin, and the guy who times the color for the, for the uh, films are sitting in the Duart Film Laboratory and we're going to the, we're going to Sundance in like two hours. We'll go drive into the airport and we're watching the movie the one last time. And I'm like, so the scene ends. And I'm like, because you boys like Mexico. Like that's the end of that scene. And I'm like, turn the light on. And like, stop it. Stop the film. And we, we stop the film. And we turn the light on. And I look at Kevin. And I'm like, we fucked up again. I'm like, this, this fucking opening scene is terrible. And he goes, what are you talking about? I'm like, it's not funny. And what was I acting like that? I'm like, this is a disaster. And the color timer goes, I think it's pretty good. He goes, I'm like, you don't know what the hell. You just stick to the color. Uh, and I'm like, <laughs> I said, we got to get out of here as soon as this is done. And we got to go back to my apartment, pick up Billy the dummy. Cause we got to do that goddamn sketch again. This is embarrassing. And he goes, we don't have time to go back. I'm like, roll the film and so we watch this film morose the rest of the way uh, just like disaster mm-hmm. and we can't get the dummy so now we go to sundance and <laughs> can't get the dummy and i was like it's like friday night is the first screening and i'm like you know my lawyer's like how are we looking how the film play and i'm like Aside from the opening scene, I think it's probably pretty good. And he goes, what are you talking about? I'm like, I just don't think it's very good. He goes, oh, man. So now he's bummed out because he's trying to sell the movie. And then we're like, I mean, and then we run into Harvey Weinstein at a bar. Right. And Harvey. He asked for a massage. Oh, yeah. He's involved here. Well, at the, Harvey's the one who saw the first film and he paid us to write Super Troopers. Mm. Then he read it and goes, I don't know if it's funny. But then again, I never know what's funny. Is that mm. what he said? So he goes, I'm not going to make this movie, but I'm going to let you guys go make it. He goes, I could stick it on the shelf and kill it. You know, I could do that, but I'm not going to do that because I like you guys. And I'm well, like, come up to my hotel room and give me a massage. <laughs> look, there were, look, the guy was, <laughs> the guy was, uh, in addition to being a sexual predator, he also had the best um, sense of independent film mm-hmm. tone uh, in in the world. Uh, and so he was two things. He was a monster and an artist. Mm-hmm. He was a monster artist, right? I mean, absolutely. Sure. A lot of us are. And so we were like, hey, pal, um, why don't you come see the film? You know, it's an independent film. I'm like, why do you come see the film that you, you could have had? You can buy it. I said, mm-hmm. we got a screening in 40 minutes. And he goes, I got a meeting in an hour and, and 15 minutes. He goes, if I get up and walk out of your screening, you're not selling your movie. Mm. And I was like, we'll put you in the back. I said, and then we'll sneak you out and then we'll bring you right back in. So for the end, he goes, all right, fine. No way. So he sits in the, he walks in, the whole theater turns and looks at him. They're like, holy shit, Harvey Weinstein's here. So then he sits in the back, the movie starts and you know, the opening is magic from the beginning. Like it is so explosive, the laughter. The tears are rolling down my face. And you know me, I'm a robot. I don't cry for shit. No feelings. No, I have no feelings, but I am weeping in relief uh, silently. Uh, and at about the 30 minute mark, I'm pacing around the lobby and Harvey Weinstein walks out and he goes, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Save the seat. I'm coming back. And I'm like, okay. He goes, it's killing in there. And I'm like, oh, I know, wow. I know, dude, I know. So then he leaves and he comes back like with 20 minutes left in the movie, sits back in movie place standing ovation. Right. And so at the end of the movie, all these distributors are coming to me and wow. saying, oh, we got uh, to show our bosses. We got to show our bosses. And Harvey Weinstein's like, see everybody looking at us. And I'm like, yeah, he goes, <laughs> you're going to dig this. He goes, what we're going to do is right now we're going to go meet at a bar down the road and the whole town's going to be like Harvey Weinstein's thinking about this movie. And I was like, okay. And he goes, he goes, yeah, it's going to be good. He goes, I have to watch the whole movie before I buy it, but, uh, get, get me a print of the film and then I'll watch it and then we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, so then he leaves and then all the 
distributors come back. They're like, don't sell it to Harvey. Don't sell it to Harvey. And I'm like, wow, it's incredible. So the next day, um, we go to the bar, and he goes, look in the paper tomorrow. Look in uh, page six. So the next day, page six, he set it up, It's and they say, the Super Troopers guys were hobnobbing with Harvey Weinstein after the screening. And it's in there, page six on the, in the Daily News or whatever it is. And so then everyone's like, ah, we got to. And so then this feeding frenzy happens uh -oh. and Fox Searchlight pays the most and they buy the film. And now you just golf every day. And now I in golf every 40s. day. Well, do you, so the movie made, oh, that's fascinating. So you'll always be grateful to that monster, Harvey Weinstein. Well, I am, but I, I, I also heard things at the time. Like I had a girlfriend who was like. Did you really? Who was, yeah, I had a girlfriend. Yeah, no, that's um, me. She was um, <laughs> working for Harvey Weinstein in uh, acquisitions. She bought films like for him and she was like you know 25 and, and like you know fox and um and she would occasionally have to like you know like her job would be you got to take a print to la uh, get on harvey's plane and fly the print to la and show him the movie and bring it back and her direct boss was like you're not getting on that plane with harvey weinstein alone i can tell you that we're sending a, a dude no assistant way. with that's that that's not happening and so i would hear that that piece of the story right i wouldn't hear sure. he raped somebody sure, but that, i would just hear that piece of the story or, or or i'd hear that like well he's going to Cannes, but he's going to stop off in rome to meet his pimp uh and and have a little half an hour in the rome airport and then he's going to meet in Cannes, where my my a novel idea for a layover yeah and then my girlfriend would be at Cannes and be like oh harvey's going to be a little late right right and she's like he stopped to see uh marco the pimp right little clues like right that. and i'm like okay i mean that's that you know whatever but in any case once i started to hear the stories i'm like yeah you know it, he has a famous temper uh and he would throw phones at his assistants yeah. like he had, you know he, he, he was a brilliant mind but he was a you could tell he was like a like a guy who was like you know overweight and and not good looking and underestimated and insulted his whole life and he he turned it into rage sure. and he was a smart guy as well and there you go another you know clue for you but he, he goes he <laughs> yeah another clue do i yeah. i you know i i i don't want to i'm not going to defend the man because he's a beast right but uh the one thing about him that was in what was uh, you know, you can't deny us. He was the king of independent film. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. And you knew uh, one of the clues for you. He's like, uh, I'll buy you a picture, kid. <laughs> Give me a date with the dummy. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, what happened with the dummy? <laughs> we should do the rest of the interviews. <laughs> dummies. What happened to the vent ventriloquism? Uh, gone? The ventriloquist yeah. dummy is in my storage. Yeah. He was a big what happened deal. To the, ven to the ventriloquist in life? We don't do it anymore. Uh, there it's is a silly voice. Well, Why do we have to do it? One of CGI. One CGI. of the biggest the comics. I think so. One of the biggest comics in Vegas is a ventriloquist. Like, uh, biggest moneymaker. Yeah, well, there's a lot of shit goes down in Vegas. Wait, so, Jay, you do a lot of things. You don't just write and direct TV and film. You also have written books. But now you've created an app called Vouch Vault. Do you want to talk about that? It's well, pretty unique. It came out of Sundance uh, when I got, you know, the film so it did so well there and the audience were so positive there. And then a year later when the film came out, we had a 35 percent fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes and I was livid. I'm like. Listen, motherfuckers, we were you should have been in Sundance in the room. You could never say what you're saying about this movie. And I'm like, who are you anyway? Who are you? Reviewers are just strangers, right? They're like, and, and when's the last time you walked up to a stranger and said, hey, what movie should I see? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just not how we really do it. We rely on our friends and our families and all that stuff. Right. So like you have these text chains on your phone. See this movie. Right. See this mm -hmm. movie. That's how that works. So. I decided 20 years ago, I'm like, I'm going to get revenge on these motherfuckers. And so I didn't know how, but, you know, four years ago, I'm like, I'm going to build an app, a revenge app to take down Rotten Tomatoes, uh, because, because who are these reviewers, these damn strangers. And so I built, you know, I'm Indian. I built an app. No, I, I did. It, I, that was actually duty. It's actually two, two. I think you did build it. You, no, I didn't. Yeah, it, these coded, these yeah. two, uh, source to India. No, these two white guys built it, built it. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
flexing on him. Um, He's like, get in there, Tim. Yeah. And, Kendall. Uh, you and work for $2 an hour, Kendall. Skyler, you better code uh, it for your little Indian boss. Eli bot. Saz <laughs> and Eric Colbert. Um, okay. And they're, you know, great guys. But they built it. Uh, and I... Um, you know, I helped helped at the end of it. Sort of, it should do this, it should do that, and we're you know, and so we you know we're up to about ten thousand uh, users. And nice. if you you know if you like a movie, put it in there, right? If you like a song, a band, a restaurant, a golf course, like anything you like, a bottle of wine, a weed strain, golf club, it's in there. And so, and it's, it's in the there. Instagram of recommendations. That's right, Instagram of recommendations, and it's there for as long as the company exists. So. If I'm like, hey, Ben, you should see this BBC documentary. It's funny. It's whatever. You're, and you're at a dinner party. You're like, what the hell was that? BBC? And you can just go to my vouch vault and go, oh, that. there it is. Yeah, I don't have to go hunting through our text where I'm tricking right. you to come I on our podcast. I notes in my in, in section. Netflix show. Right. Jay may be recommended. Right. Never remember. Right. That's what I love. It lines it up. And then you click the link and it's there it is, Netflix. Can we create a vouch vault for him that has the distance of the next shot so he doesn't have to ask three times in a row? I, I also love that it's actually people that recommendations you trust. You know, it's like it's yes. yeah. worse than like being in a restaurant asking the waiter how the burger is. It's like not great. Oh, really? But I don't eat meat, so well, I'm right. asking your That's product. right. I'm asking the general consensus. Yes, and people, you know, particularly in restaurants with Yelp, they're like. You know, the bad reviews are sometimes from the restaurant across the street, you know, or sometimes it's from somebody, you know, as, as fussy as Ben here, who did got the, the fork was a little dirty and they're like I'm tanking this restaurant that fussy. Oh. I'm just particular and I like nice. Things. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling these guys before Jay got here, I was saying like Jay really holds you and I accountable to our bullshit. He calls us out for our hypocrisy with each other, <laughs> particularly mine. It's usually mine. And I really appreciate that about you, that you look at us, not that we're circus clowns as most people do. Um, and you really listen to the things we say and hold us to our, our shit, well, which I really appreciate. If you remember, I brokered your your refriendship. Oh yeah, when we got in a fight what for a happened? few months. You yeah. guys were fighting for a few months and I was like, come on, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> did you? Yeah, I, did. I brokered it back. He did. I put it back I, I together. I appreciate that. I put it back did together. Did you say I don't appreciate <laughs> it? That's amazing. That's why I have it. So wait, Jay, you have some comedy shows coming up. I do. I have, um, I'm going to be in St. Petersburg, Florida, July 6th to 8th at the Creative Collective. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm going to be at Thalia Hall in uh, Chicago on June 21st, two shows. I'm shooting a comedy special there, um, which is going to be fun. And then I'm going to be in London on August 10th and 12th at the Bill Murray Theater and then some theater in Soho. But I've got, you know, I've got a link tree on my Instagram. And you can kind of find it all there. So question, if you do the beer bit. What's your percentage of <laughs> Jay does this thing where he challenges someone in the audience mid uh, mid set to a beer chugging com uh, competition because he is in a movie and right. Did you write beer fest also? Yeah, so we sorry. wrote beer fest. I beer love beer. that movie. Thank you. Lo the, the Das Boot is, yeah. <laughs> is the you. best thing ever. Um, but um, so anyway, he challenges and he, he often loses most of the time he loses, which is sad. I don't know why you do this, but are you, you what do you think? You're going to win in Chicago or lose? You're going to call it's it hard because I'm, hard I'm an in incredibly Chicago. fast chugger and I, I learned like the, uh, the and, and a guy and I didn't lose for a long time and and a guy one guy beat me and I was like and then I had two I jokes I lose once yeah but that's the showbiz once. buddy like uh, the, the, I had two great jokes that came out of losing that got big laughs and I'm like god damn Maybe I should lose for a little while. So I just started losing. Oh. Intentionally losing. Oh. And then Smart. I was just in Smart. Tacoma. Smart, Mikey. I was in Tacoma and I'm like, fuck this. I'm tired of losing. I'm going to win. It. And so I went boom and I won two in a row, two chugs in a row. I'm like, yeah, I can win anytime I want to. But the, is the crowd root for you more when you win or when you lose? They love it when I lose. They of go course. nuts. Yeah. They go nuts. Do you know what my theory is behind that? Is that when an actor forgets their line on stage in a play, everyone comes to the edge of their seat and I think it's because like, all right, it's truth. Yes. And I yes. think there's a piece of that yes. where people are like, 
and uh, particularly because you're selling it, you're selling that loss and they want to see you go through right. it. It's like where the bit turns off for a second. That's right. And but little CJ. do they know. <laughs> yeah, I know that you're. My well, I, I have a, a saying, which is that everything in show business is also show business. Mm. And that's Love an it. example yeah. of that. You have a lot of hilarious bits on stage. Do you get harassed on stage? People yell things from your movies and they make you do them. Because I've seen that on the golf they, course where people are like, do the mustache yeah, thing. They <laughs> do. You just have to give them space to do it. Like they're not, they're told not to yell things out, but some people just have to do it. And do you, uh, and I just wait them out. I'll, if I just repeat what they said, the audience will laugh. I'll say, what do you want to do? You want to just do quotes for a little minute? <laughs> <laughs> and that'll usually yeah, shut them up. Yeah. They'll usually no, shut them up. It was that, that movie was so successful. Did, did you actually make money on that movie? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, duh. Dude, well, did you hear the Harvey Weinstein? Yeah. They're all going to no, no, no. bid. I know the movie made a lot of money. I wonder if just since it was so early because it was your project, you actually. It was, it made so much money they couldn't hide it. They couldn't hide it. Right. They tried to hide it. And then we audited them and they were like, oh, wait, there is an extra 12 million sitting there, isn't there? Got and then they go, well, let's split it up. Do you oh, think okay. there was more money to be made back then on a movie than there is today? Well, yes, streaming because, and the writer strike people, and the battling. Yeah, people bought DVDs. Like right. that DVD was mm -hmm. sitting on top of DVD players all around the country. And people went to theaters more because before phones came out, yeah. I think that really sadly. Well, this is f phones diminish the value of movie going because we got so much content all the time. It True. became less scarce. True. But I just went to see No Hard Feelings with Jennifer Lawrence and it was packed. Your buddy directed and that. hilarious. My buddy wrote it, John Phillips. Uh, but it's it was it's excellent. And yeah, you see Jennifer full frontal. It, so you want to see that on a bigger yeah, screen. You see full frontal for a long time. I love how this is quickly how the um, discussion about making money in movies then versus now. It so quickly goes to Jennifer Lawrence full frontal. Well, that's what you got to do. Look, she, yeah, they cool. set out to make an R rated movie. And huh? part of the R rated movie magic is you're going to hear swearing, you're going to have dirty topics and you're going to have nudity. Yeah. And she understands that enough to go I'm gonna do all three she I think she kind of has to right now where her career is kind of <laughs> she's, doing fun. she's doing just great I she's the she's biggest star in the world honest act. you think so uh, she's the she's biggest there. comic uh, female star in the world for sure Jennifer Lawrence okay. absolutely so fair enough so much money on super troopers just the movie made so much money I heard a story that you had to crowd it's like you're rich <laughs> <laughs> rob him he's a Malgay in the afternoon stick him up how much are you worth? <laughs> no. uh, but if the movie made so much money forget about what you made the movie made so much Funny. I heard a story that about you having to raise funds for Super Troopers 2 for mm. the sequel. You had you crowdsourced. Well, it was it was 12, 15 years later. So the studio was unsure as to whether the new one was going to make money. Mm. So I said, it, there's an audience. They're like, are you sure there's an audience? I'm like, yeah, there's an audience. And they said, well, why don't you raise the money yourself and we'll do a co-financing thing. You guys raise the money to produce it. Uh, and then in fact, why don't you raise the money to release it too? And we'll release it. And I was like, okay. So we went out there <laughs> and raised some money to make super troopers, but we didn't have enough. And crowdfunding had sort of taken off with Veronica Mars. They raised, I was on that show. Six million. You were, I arrested, I arrested, um, what's his name? Lisa Renna's husband at the end of season one, Mr. Renna. No, no, it's a, oh. it's an, uh, oh, a famous actor by the name of, uh, shit. I'll Google it while you're okay. answering. Uh, so they made, Read that on them, thank I appreciate they it. made Sorry, six million or so. <laughs> uh, I apologize. <laughs> they made six million or so, um, crowdfunding. And I was like, well, it's a TV show and they made six million. I'm like, we could probably get close to that. And so we tried it and we made, I think, five point two or five point four from fifty five thousand people who each gave us some money. Now I walk around the country. Everyone's like, hey, I gave you money. I'm like, yeah, OK, you too. Um, <laughs> I believe you. I mean, you know, everyone says they gave me money. Did you have some sort of indecent proposal offer out on the table? Right. Uh, that if you gave us twenty five million 
uh, we would give you our semen to impregnate your wife. You could pick any one of us. Bro. Any one of us. Amazing. We didn't sell it. We didn't sell it. <laughs> but, um, ticket. but we made the 5.8 or whatever it was, 5.4. 5. And then the 55,000 people. And Fox immediately was like, oh, my God, look at that. It's incredible. And they're like, well, can we pay for the rest? Uh, but oh. we already had private investors who's like, no, 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 we're paying for the rest. And Fox is like, we'll pay for the promotion. Um, and then they did. Because you wanted to keep some profits from that. So yes. you kept the investment. Yes. So you do, so, so that, will you do a Super Troopers 3? <laughs> yeah, but they're like, no one else is paying it for it but us. Really? We're not letting you guys give us money anymore because we want to keep more. Now, would that go in theaters uh, or would that go straight to Yeah, it'll go in theaters. I don't yeah. know if it works anymore. It feels like everything straight to streaming. Uh, well, streaming movies are, are not um, that exciting. Like there's, the releases there's releases no campaign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The audiences are like looking at their phones, you know, they're like, uh, they're if I see disposable. Another, like Adam Sandler streaming release in my Netflix. And I loved Adam Sandler and SNL it's so great. much. And it's I great. love yeah. Happy Gilmore and Billy Madison. To, five, to force five pictures at him. I just right? like, uh, I guess that was how it was back in the day. Sinatra would get paid, you know, to do five yeah, and overall with Warner Brothers. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, like uh, uh, some <laughs> you got to also wrap in the whole COVID thing, right? Like mm -hmm. theaters had sort of went away a little bit. Yep. Like uh, but there's no reason why we should let Silicon Valley ruin one of our great American traditions. I do uh, love the strike for, for me personally, yeah. as someone who has great passion for movies and watching them. I think what gets me to the theater is uh, your movies. And also like Maverick. I'm like, I got to see that in the theater. I don't want to watch that at home. Yeah. Um, so stuff like that. The popcorn at home. I know. I like and I it's do nice like the popcorn. It's nice to have a feel of strangers around you laughing. Yeah, it's great. With you, right? Yeah, there's something nothing quite like it. Start, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I went to um, something about Mary originally um, in the theater, like it got a standing ovation. Yeah, it's incredible. And then when I went to see Titanic with all my like tough Philly friends, all of us went together. It was Christmas. We were off from right. school or whatever. And like, we were all looking around and like everyone was teared up and it was like a wild moment yeah. where like ev literally everyone's crying over Leo, you know, getting released into the depths. Right. So, which by the way, there was room on that ra raft she was on. He could have just jumped on there with I her. They would have floated. I mean, it was like, uh, you know, like, come on, make the raft smaller. Do a full circle bit to the. <laughs> so wait, um, Jay, you also have <laughs> a podcast. Podcast, which we're going to uh, be guests on. We're looking forward to it. Uh, um, so and you won't have to trick us. When are we doing it? I think it's um, in two weeks or so when he's <laughs> back from the com <laughs> thing. He's going to have us on. Yeah, we're honored. We're celebrities now, too. Um, oh, really? We have a show on see Netflix. How we him again? <laughs> and um, you'll see. You'll see. You're Season no two dude. is going to blow us up. You still do stand up for. Wait, I want to know about the podcast. We'll get to, he doesn't care about the podcast. To, we'll get back to the podcast. Do you do stand Next question. up to feed the podcast? Do you do stand up? up to feed the writing and directing of your next project oh yeah i feel like Chris leah does practice bits on the podcast and he just yeah. riffs and goes and goes and then eventually it synthesizes into his next no doubt i mean special. when you're when, you're, when you're, you just can't help it yeah i mean you you write stuff down while you're doing it and being that could be a bit yeah you know like because you're looking for bits like i'm i'm about to record the special and then that whole hour is going to be eventually as soon as it airs wherever it airs it's going to be gone i can't you can't do it anymore yeah because people mm -hmm. are like oh well, i know the end i know the punchline <laughs> so you got to create new bits mm -hmm. you know i have you a constantly create i have a bit. thing on my phone that is like 50 60 pages long of of stand up stand up bits yeah mm -hmm. that i haven't tried yet uh, but I got to start trying all those bits. But and yeah, you're doing them for your next show. You're doing it for <laughs> you just slide them in right. and try them here, try them there. But I mean, the podcast is really it's called Mustache Tales. It's it's I do it with this guy, Hayes MacArthur, who's like uh, played one of the Mounties and Super Troopers, too. We're both from Chicago. We, you know, we, you know, insult each other and crack jokes and, and, and interview very 
famous people and you guys apparently uh and so you you're, know you're mean to us you, know, you bully mean. us we're I not am, celebrity we're d-level right now it's house of pain we're d-level i like house of house pain. Of write pain. notes on the golf course you don't write there's no comedy bits on the golf course or are you just so no that's things? his break i will i will write something secretly where you don't see me on it because I'm like, I don't really want to be on the phone. I mean, no offense. I know that's your thing. But, um, dude, can you, I don't, it's his thing. I don't, it's his thing. I don't want to be on the phone. So it's, it it's, second to go, it's second to golf. It's, it, you know, golf is it's, is it's subservient. Right, but he's got ADD, right? He needs to be he needs to be doing something else when he's doing something. He can't just do something. <laughs> it's true. You know? So when I was when I was in stand up years ago, and even now when I have something I'm planning for, I'm constantly my brain is constantly working. I'm constantly writing notes down. Jerry Seinfeld talks about this. Yeah, he talks about it on Stern. Also. That's right. He says it's it, and Stern is like it sounds like it's torture. Great Your interview. mind is constantly thinking about bits it sounds like torture and jerry's response is you find your torture in the world it's like going to the gym every day you find your torture that you're comfortable living with every day yeah. and that's your blessing oh, that's so right smart i think that's true <laughs> i think it's right i think you know if your mind is always thinking about jokes how is that torture like yeah, it's not, not me, torture it's fun. i enjoy it I enjoy it. It's well, not torture great, for Jerry either. You're also a great storyteller. And uh, I think that's one of your, your great attributes. What's funny about that? I was just thinking of a story you told the other day. No, and no, I was wait, like, wait, it's wait. really funny. I don't want to share it right now. It's personal <laughs> between Jay and I. <laughs> Do, have you always been a great storyteller? Because I try and tell people in our business that you... T you sell through storytelling and people think it's just pushing numbers, pushing facts, being informative. That's all important. But I think the better you can curate a story around that, <coughs> the better you can cure, the better you can curate a story from those facts, the more people will feel and understand. And, and yes, humans are attracted to stories. And if you understand the structure of them, then you'll be more successful at them. And, and I used to tell perfectly great, great stories. Sure. With jokes and all that. But eventually I learned what the actual structure of a story is. And it's sort of like a comedy bit, right? Like you have to set it up. Mm -hmm. I was at the golf course. Okay. Now I know where I was. I was with these two, you know, dudes, right? He, he almost called us something derogatory. I did. I almost did. And then I'm like, I'm going to hold off. Um, and, uh, and, and then you, you know, you, so you set the scene, you set the character and then you start going into the thing the and, stakes, you, and, and you, and you end with something funny. Is you that know? how you think of curating a story every time you tell it? No, I suppose I naturally do that. Yeah. You know, I suppose I automatically set up the story because that's what you have to do. <laughs> he uh, killed me the other day for attempting to tell a story. I was like, choking on you know what I'm talking about? I do. I do. <laughs> when, right before he threw his golf club and almost got stuck in the tree. I said, the, I played golf with these guys the other day and they're drinking beers at 830. And then you were like. Is that the end of the story? Oh, I felt no yeah, stakes. Yeah, 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 it was yeah. so short. I just was in shock and wanted you guys to share the shock with me. And he was just like, bro, I wrote a movie called Beer Fest. That's not that big of a surprise. It's not a story it's that people were drinking at golf at 8.30 on a golf course. Sorry, but you were <laughs> so upset about your golf game. You didn't notice any of this that was going on. It was fucking mad. I him never felt story. so stupid. I never <laughs> felt so stupid and so unfunny. Oh my god. Anyway, so wait. Thank God we have him to tell. Yeah. The wait. Stories. So back to the, as we wrap up here. Back to the podcast. Is there anything unique about it aside from you guys roasting each other that would be a reason for people should? No. Like, if you in. like me, um, <laughs> then listen. And if you don't. Don't. <laughs> yeah, um, really convincing. You know, I, I had a dream last night. Um, yeah. Because I was coming on this podcast and apparently my mind was thinking about it. Sure. And so I woke up. I didn't wake up. I was dreaming. <laughs> And I'm like in the podcast and the podcast is happening in a very dark room with a bunch of pillows on the ground. Mm. And I'm like, I don't even see any microphones like and you guys are clearly on some hallucinogenic. <laughs> sure. And I'm not. And you're like just hanging around. And, and I'm like, there's no questions. You're not asking me any questions <laughs> at all. Ben was a pickle. I was. No. <laughs> and he has Ben has long hair in it and is starting to get super sexual with me. <laughs> and I'm like, 
what is this kind of fucking podcast is this? <laughs> and I woke up and I'm like, hard. No, that wasn't, you woke the, up that hard. wasn't the podcast. <laughs> okay. I did, yeah, I woke up hard. I always wake up I woke hard. up. I finished. <laughs> <laughs> and I quickly jacked off and then I went back to bed. <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm so grateful uh, that the podcast, that there were actual questions today. Uh, I know there were microphones and light. I'm really grateful. I just want you guys to know that it wasn't the dream that I had. Did we impress you? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, the dream. Well, <laughs> you know, what impresses yeah. me is that these people at the agency allow you to do this. Well, you're getting paid right now. I it's, mean, what's it, going on? By the way, before they get give you, salaries. You, you actually <laughs> see a really small piece of his in my life. Yeah. Um, you'd actually be surprised seeing us at work. We're uh-huh. not the complete animal lunatics that you see on the golf course. Well, I'm a little bit <laughs> lunatic yeah. in my work. So, Jay, is it, um, before we tell everyone where they can find you, is there anything else that you want to share or promote today? I think I've, I think I've shoved my stuff down the audience. Just throwing Honestly, enough. it's been obnoxious. I just wanted to be polite. <laughs> um, where can they find you? I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on TikTok. You have to, you have to Google my name, but you'll find it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the legend, Jay Chandrasekhar. I'm Zach Goldsmith at Zach Goldsmith24. This is Tom Belak. I'm Ben Belak. Um, guys, thank you for tuning in for um, our highest celebrity on our show darkest. ever Def- he's definitely the darkest, darkest um in comedy and and hugh <laughs> highest is yeah, that what you mean to say? Not, yeah yeah i think you're what did i say highest i'm not high no yeah yeah you're the darkest. highest <laughs> you're definitely darkest the darkest, celebrity the darkest i like Thank not you. the most followed on the gram Put your hand on that the other one it goes like this and you go like that. Oh, wow. Oh, I see. You guys should do an emoji change when you send those, the color <laughs> change. Um, guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of To Live and Buy in Los Angeles with our friend, idol, and bully, Jay Chandrasekhar. Oh, for sure. Bully. Love you, LA.